the theory that kind of underlies a lot of our, our practical work here is this idea of psychological inoculation, which follows the biomedical metaphor or analogy pretty much exactly. So just as the body needs lots of copies of potential invaders in order to mount an effective immune response, really works the same with the human mind. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Parton, and you are listening to The Feedback Loop by Singularity. This week, my guest is Sander van der Linden, who is a professor of social psychology at the University of Cambridge, where he has also directed the Social Decision-Making Lab since 2016. In this episode, we explore Sander's latest publication, Foolproof, in which he details the many ways in which humans fall prey to misinformation and the ways in which we can resist such persuasion. This primarily takes us on a tour of his work around pre-bunking, an experience that gives one an increased resistance to misinformation through a process that is very much like a mental vaccine. Unfortunately, we had some unreliable internet in a snowstorm that cut this conversation a bit shorter than usual, but luckily we were able to get through the main points of Sanders' work before I lost electricity. So this will be a bit shorter and sweeter than usual, but without further ado, Everyone, please welcome to the feedback loop, Sander van der Linden. Your book, Foolproof, Why Misinformation Infects Our Minds and How to Build Immunity, uh, has just come out. And I just was wondering if you could give us a little bit of insight into the background and motivation that led you to write this book, why this was a subject matter that you felt was important to invest your time into it. Yeah, you know, I was always interested in writing a, a popular book. Um, you know, part of the reason why I love studying psychology be, is because it's relevance to humans and people. And you know, I want to I want to tell people about stuff that we find in our experiments in a, in a way that's relatable and accessible. So that's always been sort of on the back of my my mind. But then, I think what was a particular motivator for me was that once we had, I never felt like I had. Well, enough to say. So I just sort of wanted to wait until we had a, a program of research over numerous years that really added up to, to something. And, um, you know, doing this for trying to define and monitor and fight misinformation for what feels now quite a long time, I felt there were some interesting insights there for, for people to, you know, take away from uh, some, some interesting takeaways that um, that I thought people might enjoy, both in terms of the evidence that we've gathered, in terms of what works, what doesn't work, um, how the brain processes misinformation, how it spreads in social media. And so I felt there was really something there that uh, that I could turn into to an interesting story um, and also some really practical, you know, practical evidence based tips that um, we were able to to gather over the years. And, you know, at the beginning, it was it was sort of like, OK, well, this is an interesting theory and you know, some interesting experiments, but, you know, I don't want to put out a book and something that's that's you know quite preliminary so i wanted to wait and see see where it went and then you know we had all of these interesting collaborations with tech companies and 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 public health agencies and we could really test things in a you know in a in a large on a larger scale and that kind of led to a lot of interesting insights a lot of feedback and that kind of motivated me to sort of tell that story because often that would be interesting for people to know like what's going on you know, at Meta or Google or, um, you know, inside, inside some of these government agencies, what are people up to and, and uh, you know, are they really trying to fight misinformation? And so I thought I had some interesting insights that I that wanted to relate to people. And, and that was kind of the ultimate motivator for the book. Could, could you share a few examples or one example of like one of the research studies or one of the um, collaborations that were particularly was particularly insightful to you or really exemplified what you're working on? Yeah. And so, you know, one of the examples was that we had produced some um, some games. Uh, one of the games is called Bad News, uh, and it, it's, it's sort of a, a deep dive simulation into how nefarious actors do people online. And it's, you know, it's meant to be slightly radical in the sense that you know, it's not sort of a, a typical sort of media literacy education where people try to be a good investigative journalist. It's quite the opposite. It's more, you know, exposing yourself to weakened doses, 
or you know that we control uh but still you know kind of uh, you're messing around with the dark arts of, of manipulation to, to try to build resistance by by seeing how you know how people are duped and um we were building tests and and quizzes to see if you know after 20 minutes of playing this game people actually improve in their ability to spot online misinformation um, um and then scientifically we we took the same style kind of combining humor with the the inoculation metaphor or the, the idea of pre-bunking, which I'm not sure if your listeners are familiar with, but the idea is, is, is basically that instead of debunking, you kind of pre-bunk by preemptively exposing people to a weakened dose of the quote-unquote virus so that people can build up mental antibodies. Um, and that that's kind of the gist behind the approach. Could you say more about that in terms of what you mean by the the idea of a virus or like inoculating against that, just to tie it more to, to what you're really talking about here so people have a firm understanding. Yeah, absolutely. So let me let me back up and, and sort of explain it. So the theory that kind of underlies a lot of our, our practical work here is this idea of psychological inoculation, which follows the biomedical metaphor or analogy pretty much exactly. So just as vaccines trigger, um, or at least vaccines introduce weakened or inactivated strains of a virus into the body, which then triggers the production of antibodies to help confer resistance against future infection, it really turns out you can do the same with uh, misinformation. By preemptively exposing people and by preemptively refuting weakened doses of falsehoods or techniques that are used to spread misinformation, people over time can build up cognitive antibodies or, or mental immunity. And you know, just as the body needs lots of copies of potential invaders in order to mount an effective immune response, it really works the same with the human mind. So the more examples the more weakened doses, and the weakened dose is important because you want, don't want to dupe people with actual misinformation, right? And so you have to you have to weaken it to the extent that you can actually refute it in a very persuasive way, or show people, give people the ability to dismantle the techniques of manipulation uh, in advance. Um, and when you do that, um, people can sort of build up resistance. And the more micro doses or examples you can give, the better the mind becomes at identifying them in a whole range of examples. So not just the the weakened dose that you've created for a specific falsehood or a specific conspiracy theory. Um, but, you know, once you give people enough examples, they can start sort of see the underlying um, tricks and identify it in, in new content. And that's kind of the where we follow the, um, the analogy. And I'm happy to sort of talk about the psychological limitations of debunking and why we, we sort of opted for uh, this pre-bunking approach. Um, but when we got to the stage of... Um, actually doing this outside of the lab environment um and even our games you know they're in a controlled environment and you know it's a choose your own adventure game but we control the scenarios and right and so it's it's it, it was still you know pretty scientific in, in its in its setup um and so with these videos that we created um we were able to test them live on youtube and i think that was exciting for me because up until this point you know a lot of social media companies were like okay interesting but you know we don't know how this works with our users and how our people are going to respond to it and whether it's going to be effective on our platform and every time it's the same story and so we always have to do everything from scratch for every social media company you know we've did that with whatsapp with meta with google um and so every time we go through the same sort of process and i understand it and it's it, it is different every time and so it is it is interesting um and so we created these videos for youtube and the brilliant thing that google came up with was that you know they said well how are you going to scale this how are you going to get this to people who would otherwise be quote unquote vaccine hesitant uh, uh um, and so they had a really good idea i mean they said you know youtube has that annoying sort of ad space right and so what what if they just put it in the ad space before you know people are exposed to potential misinformation um and i think i'm supposed to say that google doesn't or youtube doesn't release anything any information about its algorithm, so I can't speak to what its algorithm can or cannot do. Uh, but let's hypothetically assume that its algorithm could, with some probability, identify whether a video might contain some questionable information. It could automatically insert the pre-bunk in the ad space, and then people would, you know, it would preempt it, and it would prevent some of the the, the difficulties you get with trying to debunk things after the fact. And we did an experiment with millions of people live on YouTube and actually were able to test that um, and found that that actually that that does help. I mean, not as the effects were not as impressive as in the lab because, you know, it's live. People are distracted. It's on social media. But but it um, it still worked. And that really was one of the best 
kind of test of this concept and Google made that possible. There was a lot of internal, a lot of legal stuff, a lot of internal complications. And so it was, uh, it was a very interesting experience. And um, I talk about it in the book in, in terms of what I can say um, and the lessons that we've learned from that. Um, but yeah, so that, that was another kind of real world instance where, you know, I, I thought that was, that was interesting. And uh, yeah. What's a, so what's a, an example of maybe like a pre-bunked piece of content? What does the, the vaccine or the small dose that you're setting somebody up with kind of look like? Is it a 15, 20 second clip that is slightly misleading or that actually instructs people on what fake news looks like, or is kind of like a priming exercise? Like what's the, what kind of thing are you really trying to show them in this pre-bunk experience? Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. I mean, up until now, it sounds pretty, pretty abstract. So let me let me give the listeners kind of a concrete example. So there's there's various ways that you can pre bunk. Um, and it depends on on the level of risk that that you, you know, are comfortable with. Um, and it's sort of, um, it's not like a nudge or a prime. And so those interventions just kind of ask nudge people to be accurate when they're on social media, but they don't confer any skills on people um, and so our interventions are a bit more involved in the sense that we want to preempt manipulation or falsehoods and actually give people ways to detect it and that requires a bit of time and that's also that's been a struggle since the beginning in terms of how can you get a 20 minute simulation down to a 30 second video clip and still still have it work right uh, to come back to giving you a concrete example so we studied the kind of techniques that people use to mislead others online for years. And we kind of documented them. We call them the, the six degrees of manipulation and includes things like polarizing people with you know polarizing language and headlines and using emotions to fear monger and cause outrage, building conspiracy theories, uh, trolling people and, and trying to distort public perception with, with bot armies and, um, and fake experts. And there's a whole, we have a whole sort of documented list of these techniques. Um, and with the YouTube videos, what we did was we didn't tell people what they need to believe. We didn't talk about any specific issues. We, the, the, the video starts uh, and it revolves around this idea of a false dilemma. So as you probably know, a false dilemma is, is a situation where you present people with two options. Well, in fact, there's, there's more. Um, and the reason that's interesting is because there's a lot of YouTube, they're called YouTube gurus who try to radicalize people with extremist rhetoric. And, and the, one of the most common strategies is to present people with false options, uh, which is that, oh, you're, you know, either you join ISIS or you're not a good Muslim, or, you know, we can't really care about immigrants because we've got a homelessness problem in the United States, right? And so there's there's these sort of false dichotomies that are floated. And at, at first, that's convincing to people. They're like, oh, yeah, you know. But then when you think about it more, you realize, wait, is that really true? Um, can't you do both at the same time? Um, and sure, I mean there there are some resource constraints in society, right? But but most of it is 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 misleading. Um, but without talking about any of that, the the video, the YouTube video, cut straight into Star Wars. I'm not sure if you're a Star Wars fan, sure. uh, but you know, uh, uh, a clip appears, and you have uh, Revenge of the Sith, um, and so Obi Wan is talking to Anakin Skywalker, who kind of says like. Either you're with me or you're my enemy. And then Obi-Wan replies that only a Sith deals in absolutes. Uh, and then the narrator explains why that's a false dichotomy and how that is used to mislead people online. And then the microdose comes of giving people examples of these type of things. And then we test people with, with real social media polarizing sort of false dilemmas. And we find that, you know, using that completely inactivated kind of strain uh, it does help people spot these misleading techniques in real sort of uh, content on the YouTube platform, for example. Yeah. So that that's kind of a concrete example. Um, now, you, you could use uh, you don't have to use Star Wars as the weekend dose. You could use something about immigration or education or climate or healthcare, um, and that can work fine. But um, yeah, a lot of it's getting better now. I mean, we're working with Meta on, on, on pre-bunking climate misinformation on their platform now, but many years ago, a lot of these companies were not willing to say anything about about any of these issues, and so that yeah. you know, as a scientist, that makes your job harder. Is is the idea, in essence, to kind of tackle some of the inherent cognitive biases that humans have without maybe directly trying to tell people what they should believe? And in a sense, you're almost just trying to empower critical thought before you hand somebody over to something that might be um, attempting to kind of usurp that critical thought. Exactly. And I think that's the thing most people across the political spectrum can probably get on board with. And that's also why I've kind of embraced, embraced this approach in that, 
you know, it's, it's, um, at the end of the day, we're just trying to empower people to discern repeated manipulation techniques so that people can make up their own mind about what they want to believe or not. And it's totally fine with me. Well, I mean, I guess not entirely, but I can live with the fact that if people can identify manipulation techniques and still decide they want to vote for someone or still decide that they want to buy into something, then, then, then that's what it is. But at least people are empowered to then make that decision. Um, I think a lot of people will at least think about revising their beliefs um, once they can sort of see through some of these uh, tactics. And some of it, you know, is, is, um, is so well documented that some, some people don't know that this has been going on for a long time. So in the 1800s, you have wonderful examples of paintings where cows are, are, are kind of spewing out of people's mouths. And that had to do with the, the first vaccine, which was using cowpox to vaccinate huh. people against smallpox. And so people were talking about how it changes your DNA and you're going to turn into a cow hi- human cow hybrid. And, you know, the same narratives you see now is it's the same trope, just 200 years apart. Um, and so all, all that we're doing is exposing these tropes and techniques. Um, and um, it's a little bit more specific than critical thinking. I mean, sure, scientific literacy is good. N- you know, numeracy is good. Education is great. Um, but, you know, the way that we've tried to do this is to kind of simulate the types of attacks people might face and then inoculate them against those type of attacks in advance. So it's a little bit more specific, a little bit more about actually exposing people to some potentially threatening information rather than educating them about general facts. But I think both are, um, again, not to present false dichotomies, I think both are, are laudable goals. Uh, um, and But yeah, that's how it works. When you mentioned there that some of these tropes are, are most timeless in a sense, right? There's there's always been some form of social influence, some sense of conformity, some sense of persuasion taking place. Uh, just as a social species, you know, we love to gossip and, and navigate these circumstances. But is there something in your mind that makes the digital realm um, in the realm, I guess, of misinformation uh, in a digital space uh, particularly pernicious that maybe exacerbates it or makes it, you know, extra dangerous? Is it, you know, is there something in like the memetics of, of and how things are wired that you see as, is a big problem? Yeah, I do think so. I mean, I, you know, of course, there's always been rumors and unverified stories and people have always dealt with politicians lying and, and things like that. And so that's, you know, obviously that's, that's, that has a very long history. But I, I do think that the way that the online environment has, um, shifted the information landscape presents lots of difficulties for people that I think we haven't fully digested. So I think at a very basic level, people have, you know, what's called a truth bias. And that that kind of makes sense most of the time. So, so the truth bias is basically that we think most information that's coming at us is true. Uh, and so that makes sense when you're in an environment where people are not constantly lying to you or where you don't see a lot of misinformation. Um, and then you have the fact that the online environment has become super fragmented, uh, which also presents difficulties, not only for how people process information, but also for pushing out corrections, because the corrections are not getting anywhere, because the the, the landscape is so fragmented, and people are in their own echo chambers that they're actually not seeing the corrections, and they're not getting through the people. Um, and so trying to correct stuff becomes much more difficult, because it's so diffuse. Um, and then I think there's a lot of uh, manipulation that happens that people are not aware of. And I think that is perhaps the biggest difference with um, what you would otherwise see offline. So take dark posts, for example. A lot of election campaigns use dark posts, which are ads that appear on your timeline from people that you have nothing to do with. And they only appear on your timeline and not other people's timeline. And you ne- you don't necessarily know that. Micro-targeting, which you know, I've, I've relabeled uh, weapons of mass persuasion in the book, um, which is really about the fact that companies are scraping your digital footprints and they can predict um, your gender, your political ideology, your sexuality, your personality, as long as they get enough likes. You know, if you've liked certain pages, it, it becomes relatively easy to sort of predict the things that you're into and the things you might click on. And so the more data that they have in the matrix, the better these models become. Some are not very accurate and some are based on how much data they can gather on you. But if you're if you have an online presence, if you have cookies, if you're offering data, then you can be targeted. And I think the problem is that, that people are not aware of it and people are not conscious of it. So it's one thing to opt into being targeted, let's say, with book recommendations. Right. Um, but if you're being targeted with um, 
misleading news ads without your knowledge, that's much more problematic, um, especially if that influences the way that you might vote, even when, when, you know, when, when you've not consented to that. Um, so I think that's where things get much more problematic, that bad actors can actually leverage these new tools to influence people in, in ways that we didn't have before and for which we have no, no good safeguards at the moment. Yeah, p- perhaps this sounds like a, a naive or obvious question even, but given your study of, of human judgment and decision making, do you feel that awareness of, of cognitive biases, awareness of ways that we might be manipulated um, really does inoculate us in some sense? Because I feel like it's almost one of those things where facts are are great but they're really hard to stick in someone's mind if they don't have an emotional salience or if they're not somehow um, useful to bind you to your social group. Like, you, you know what I mean? It's very hard to often make these things stick. So in your experience, does the awareness of these things really help people go, oh, okay, that's a thing that is trying to manipulate me. I shouldn't pay attention to that. Even though I agree with it, I'm going to pretend like it's not real. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, we know that you know at a basic level, awareness of cognitive of cognitive biases doesn't doesn't necessarily fix it. Uh, and so, you know, in a book, I give people an optical illusion and then sort of tell them what the illusion is. But you know, you're still looking at it and you're still seeing the illusion. Um, and so that's that's I think it's it's similar in some in some ways. Uh, knowledge does help, but but it doesn't fully kind of solve the problem. Um, and and you see that with them. Um, you know the literature on debunking and and fact checking, and so it has some effect, some positive effect. But then a lot of misinformation lingers, and people continue to retrieve false details from memory, even when they acknowledge having seen a correction, which is what we call the the continued influence of misinformation. And that kind of occurs because misinformation activates lots of so so human memory is kind of like a spider a spider like web of a network with you know with lots of different links and nodes and. You know, once misinformation integrates itself into your mental model of how something works, it becomes like a game of whack-a-mole. So once you correct one one falsehood, another one pops up somewhere else, and you know it's all interlinked. And so trying to undo that is actually very difficult. Um, and so what one of the things that they found is that when you debunk something, you need to give people an alternative. Just saying something is false doesn't work because if people tag something as false in their memory, and if they don't have an alternative explanation of what's true instead, they're just going to revert back to the thinking the what they initially thought um but that that alternative explanation isn't fully enough in itself either and so it also it needs to be sticky it needs to be simple you know science tends to be nuanced complex whereas misinformation is often simple and 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 has some psychological appeal and so how can you make science sticky and simple and then the last factor is that the correction really needs to cohere with what people want to be true um and that kind of gets at what you were saying earlier and that you know, trying to frame corrections in a way that doesn't antagonize people is really difficult. Um, so for all of these reasons, I think it's often easier to try to pre-bunk and debunk because you prevent some of this encoding, um, it's kind of a memory term that people use, but you kind of prevent, you prevent this stuff from, from being integrated into, into people's kind of knowledge or mental model in, in the first place. But pre-bunking also requires that people have some incentive to, to pay attention and, and participate, right? And so where I think it differs is that our approach leverages the idea of, well, two ideas. One is that people have to come to terms with the fact that they might be susceptible to nefarious persuasion, and two, that they perceive some sort of manipulative intent. And I think those factors are really big motivational factors. And so part of the inoculation is based around ability. Like, okay, yeah, you have to help people actually be able to become aware of their biases and how to spot it. But the other part is really about motivation. You also have to give people the motivation. Um, and the way to do that, we found in, in kind of the persuasion literature, is that people start paying attention when they think other people are manipulating them. And that's so that this idea of perceived manipulative intent is really important. And that's often when we focus on disinformation and and, and techniques, because that's kind of where people become more concerned. And then also they need to understand that they're vulnerable. Lots of people are overconfident and think that fake news, they're not gonna fall for fake news and that's not a problem for them. And so some of our simulations try to elicit this effect for people to actually show we can dupe you um, and, and, and it needs to trigger some level of threat and vulnerability. Um, and that's 
kind of part of the inoculation process. And I think part of what helps it um, be a little more effective in, in that sense, that it's not only that you give people these skills, but they also um, have some level of motivation. But we do know that people also lose that motivation over time. Um, and so the inoculation effect does wear off over time, especially when people come across contradictory information or, you know, they get social cues that say something else. And so um, we've started implementing what we call booster shots, uh, just as with regular vaccines, you know, people need to be boosted. Otherwise, you might lose your immunity. Mm. Yeah, th this makes me think a little bit of uh, conformity in general in the psychological sense and <clears throat> I guess intent malice and intentional malice so i'm wondering you know we have the experiments done by ash where participants are shown you know several lines of, of varying lengths and they they're told to match lines and if their peers match lines that are obviously not the same they will often conform and say that they agree even though they they, they don't and this makes me think about like trending content trending hashtags trending ideologies or memes that uh, kind of permeate the internet. And I'm wondering, is, is more of what you're seeing in terms of maybe misinformation or, or this kind of social influence a result of things like that, which are not really intentional, they're just kind of a, a, an attractor that people just slowly gravitate towards over time because they feel that's the standard? Or is it more something that is intentional, more malice based, where you do have these kind of gurus you mentioned earlier, who are purposely trying to seed bad ideas into the ecosystem, informational ecosystem to um, persuade somebody or to exploit them financially. Yeah, I think it's both. And so we definitely see these kind of uh, gurus and high level influencers who are intentionally spreading this stuff. And I, I kind of liken it to a, a multi level marketing scheme. So there's the people on top, cooking up the conspiracies and then there's the you know the people who are who are being duped and spreading them and suffering some of the consequences um but i think there's also and this gets to the other point i think something fundamental about the social incentives on social media that lead people to spread and endorse misinformation and we've done some research on that so we looked at millions of posts on on both facebook and twitter of uh, media accounts and as well as congressional accounts and what we find is that the stuff that goes viral um, is best predicted by the degree to which the language derogates the other side. Uh, and so, this, you know, for example, you know, if 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 let's say if you're a Republican, then the a post one of the most popular posts was like, "Check out Joe Biden's latest brain freeze." Uh, and then if you're a liberal, it was it was something you know nasty about Trump. Um, and so and so the idea is that um, the sort of outgrouping. Um, receives a lot of engagement on social media. Negative emotional stuff does too, uh, what we call emotional moral words like outrage and, and evil and, and pedophiles and hate and that sort of stuff gets a lot of traction too. Um, but in particular, the, the sort of dunking on the other side, and, and this is what we call the perverse incentives of, of social media, um, that what drives engagement uh, are really just these negative incentives. And that kind of leads to this vicious circle of people um, sharing types of content that the algorithm rewards, and then people feed into that, even though when the, explicitly in surveys they state that they don't want that type of content uh, on their on their feed. Um, and yeah, we've done we just completed an experiment that I briefly talk about in the book about is it worth changing changing some of these incentives? And we do find that if you reward people either socially or financially, so we started paying people, um, then they're much more likely to give an accurate answer. Um, and so that tells us something about the incentives on social media versus when we experimentally control the incentives. And, and so they could change them. And I think that could lead to, to a much better online conversation and potentially uh, a reduced sort of level of, of misinformation sharing. Yeah, I've been talking to people a lot about this lately, this idea that, you know, when we were evolving in smaller groups, there <clears throat> were a lot of evolutionary wirings that made us very sensitive to our social status to whether we were doing something taboo if we were being seen as trustworthy or as a free rider or something like that and it feels like in the online space a lot of those checks and balances that we evolve for no longer really ex exist especially because it's anonymous and there's all these perverse incentives so do you do you feel like we can 
somehow, you know, like you said, with that example, do you think there is a real possibility that if we do shift some of the incentives online, we can maybe rebuild or reintegrate some of those early wirings that made us focus more on treating each other well as, as a way to maintain status or, you know, look good in the eyes of our peers? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think, I mean, that's definitely the, the thinking at the moment that it's all about changing these incentives and that would then hopefully lead to different, eliciting different kinds of opinions and behaviors uh, on online. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, people are some studies that kind of show what they call the interesting of true effect. So that sometimes people share stuff because they think it it would be interesting if it were true, um, um, right? Even though they might personally not believe it, but it's the sort of social thing that um, they want to pass it on. Um, and, um, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, it, it's interesting because, you know, deception is obviously also common in the animal kingdom. Um, and uh, prey use a, a, a lot of techniques to do predators, right? Sometimes they feign death or they change colors. So they try to exploit uh, weaknesses in the environment uh, to, to try to sort of, you know, do, do predators. And I think in the same way, bad actors can now do that online. They can exploit our weaknesses and, and biases um, to, to get people to share misinformation. So changing those incentives might help deter some of that activity.